Welcome to the Justice Journal podcast. I'm Sacramento County District Attorney Anne Marie Schubert. I hope you enjoy this podcast series where we discuss important public safety issues and provide insight into who we are as an office and what we do both in the courtroom and in the community to provide the highest level of public safety through prosecution, prevention, and innovation. Welcome to the Justice Journal podcast. I'm your host, Shelley Oreo. Today's podcast is the last of a four-part series on driving under the influence, otherwise known as DUI, ending with today's discussion on DUI involving prescription and mixed drugs. To talk more about this public safety issue on our roads and highways, I'm joined by CHP officer, Travis Herbert, supervising criminalist from the district attorney's crime lab, Craig Trebold, and our lead prosecutor over DUI cases, Greg Hayes. Welcome everyone. Can each of you briefly just introduce yourselves, including your background and your current roles? Thank you. My name is Gregory Hayes. I'm a deputy district attorney here in Sacramento County. I've been working for the Sacramento County District Attorney's Office for eight years. I've had a number of assignments. I've prosecuted numerous uh, DUIs while I've worked here, as well as drug DUIs and vehicular homicides involving alcohol and drugs. Currently, I am the lead prosecutor for the DUI, Drug DUI Misdemeanor Prosecution Education and Outreach Program. This program is funded by a grant from the California Office on Traffic Safety through the National Highway Traffic Mm -hmm. Safety Administration. What you're listening to now is part of a four-part podcast series uh, that is part of the education and outreach efforts that go along with the grant. I'm Officer Herbert. Um, I'm with the California Highway Patrol. I've been uh, with the patrol for 22 years. I am with the impaired driving section, and uh, my role uh, is a drug recognition expert instructor. I'm also a standardized field sobriety test instructor. I, I uh, teach A Ride, which is advanced roadside impaired driving enforcement, and I talk, uh, t- uh, do lots of presentations on uh, drugs and impaired driving. Uh, My name is Craig Trebold. I'm supervising criminalist at the Sacramento County District Attorney's Crime Lab. I currently oversee the laboratory's toxicology unit and the crime scene response team. I've been at the laboratory for 17 years. I started as a criminalist in the alcohol section, which is part of our overall toxicology unit. Um, After a couple of years of doing alcohol, I started uh, doing screening and confirmation of various drugs in both blood and urine. Um, At this point, I've analyzed uh, thousands of samples for the presence of drugs. I've testified close to 200 times in criminal trials, uh, mostly related to uh, DUI and uh, DUID. I'm also dual board certified by the American Board of Criminalistics and the American Board of Forensic Toxicology. Uh, And I also teach uh, forensic toxicology and instrumentation courses uh, for UC Davis as part of their Master of Science in Forensic Science program. And I also am an instructor for the California Criminalistics Institute, uh, which is run by the California uh, Department of Justice. Great. Thank you all. Let's start by talking about the problem of DUIs involving prescription medicines and mixed drug use while driving. Officer Herbert, I'm going to start with you. What information or data is known about people who drive under the influence of prescription medicine and mixed drugs? Is there any data available or, or even anecdotally? Well, as far as like hard numbers, uh, that's difficult uh, to to obtain because when somebody's arrested for the offense of driving under the influence of drugs, um, it is it's a broad umbrella that covers both prescription drugs and illegal drugs. So when you're trying to parse that information, um, it becomes a little difficult. Um, I'm sure Craig is going to have a will be able to answer a lot um, more intelligently on that. But anecdotally. Um, I think that um, when we look out there and we recognized how many people and how many, you know, millions of prescriptions that we have every year um, and how many people may or may not understand that when they do take that pill, um, it could impair them. And and, and I'm sure if you talk and they talk to their doctor and they talk to their pharmacist, they're going to understand that, hey, you know, this might impair you. You need to make sure that you understand what it does to you before you get behind the wheel or operate any um, machinery. That's why we have those labels or stickers on the on the prescription bottles. And if you do pull somebody over who's showing signs of impairment, 
Are there any ways that officers can detect uh, whether they're under a prescription medicine or mixed drugs, or is it just a basic impairment? Um, so indicator? for basic impairment, yes, they're going to see that uh, they're going to, you know, a, a, a standardized field sobriety testing uh, trained officer um, can tell basic impairment. Um, however, uh, we, we do send officers to uh, both a ride advanced roadside impaired driving enforcement and uh, DRE for purposes of being able to tell if they're on the influence of drugs specifically uh, and or alcohol or a combination of drugs and alcohol. Okay, so it sounds like there's really no way in the field to know what kind of drug, if it's a prescribed drug or anything like not, that. Not in okay. the field. We have to bring them into a um, into a controlled setting, and then mm -hmm. from there, even even there, it's it's we can tell if it's like a, a certain class of drugs, but I couldn't tell you what specific drug it is. Okay, so that's a good transition over to Craig to talk about um, what are you seeing at the crime lab, and when you're analyzing some of the DUI, DUI cases, uh, what do you see specifically with prescription drugs and mixed use? I'm mean, assuming that there you can identify and determine. Yeah, so just to give a little bit of context, we analyze about 4,000 uh, cases for toxicology every year. Um, we used to limit our toxicology testing to cases where either drugs were suspected uh, by the officer um, or where the subject admitted to using drugs. Uh, or cases where our uh, alcohol, blood alcohol result was a 0.08% or less. Uh, but in 2020, we transitioned. And since then, we've been screening uh, all samples, regardless of their alcohol content, uh, for the presence of drugs. And what we found is that in our DUI drivers, about uh, half of the samples with a blood alcohol concentration above a 0.08% also have drugs present. Um, so clearly, combinations of alcohol with drugs are very common. Uh, but it's also very common for us to find poly drug use, uh, where our DUI drivers are using uh, multiple drugs at the same time. And um, in these combinations, they often involve prescription drugs. Um, most frequently, it's going to be sedatives or uh, various pain medications. Okay, so are there names that you can provide as what you're finding that most people would recognize? Yeah, so uh, in terms of the drugs that we find in our uh, DUI cases, um, the top drugs that we find are uh, cannabinoids. So that would be drugs stemming from a person using marijuana or another cannabis product. Um, after that, it's uh, methamphetamine and cocaine. Uh, but beyond those, really the rest of our top 10 and really probably our top 20 um, are just about all prescription drugs. Now, whether they're being used legitimately by prescription or not isn't clear to us um, because we don't get case information unless we're actually going to trial to testify on a case. Um, but the top prescription drugs that we see in our cases are fentanyl, um, which likely is not actually being used by prescription in our subjects. Um, it's often being used illicitly. It's found in uh, counterfeit tablets a lot of times. Um, but it, it is considered a prescription drug. Um, another one would be alprazolam, which is uh, Xanax. It's an anti-anxiety medication. Uh, diazepam and nordiazepam. So diazepam is uh, another anti-anxiety medication. People would probably know it by the name Valium. Uh, we also see a lot of methadone. Uh, we see lorazepam, which is another anti-anxiety medication. Uh, it goes under the trade name Ativan. Uh, and then after that, we see uh, some pain medications, like I mentioned, specifically uh, hydrocodone, which is Norco or Vicodin. Uh, we see oxycodone a lot, which is uh, Percocet or Percodan. Uh, we see um, other anxiety medications, things like uh, Flualprazolam, which is actually a designer version of that Alprazolam that I already mentioned, um, which is actually not prescription. Um, but is in the same class of drugs. Um, and then, so the overall list of things that we see contains a lot of those types of drugs, things that are often uh, anxiety medications or uh, things being used for treatment of uh, chronic pain conditions. And is that something new? Or are there any recent trends or is that, has that been consistent for quite a while? 
Um, overall, our results have been fairly consistent, uh, but we have seen a significant increase uh, in our DUID cases involving fentanyl, uh, which aligns pretty well with the, the overall opioid epidemic that uh, our country has been experiencing over the last several years. Um, I mentioned fluvalprazolam being a, a designer uh, drug. So we have seen um, an increase in these so-called designer drugs, um, mostly designer uh, what are called benzodiazepines. Those are those uh, drugs like alprazolam, diazepam, um, that are mostly anti-anxiety medications. Uh, so in 2015, we saw a first wave of a drug called etizolam, which is kind of the first designer benzodiazepine to come through our lab. Then in 2018 to 2019, we started seeing that flu alprazolam. Um, and over the last 18 months or so, uh, we've been seeing a new version uh, called flubromazolam. So there are a lot of these designer drugs uh, that are uh, gaining popularity in our society, uh, and they kind of change over time what is most popular. Um, so in 2020, we did also expand our screening capabilities in the toxicology unit. So we're picking up a, a much broader range of drugs. One of those drugs uh, that we didn't used to test for, but we can see now uh, is a drug called gabapentin, um, which uh, we currently are able to screen for it, but we're not able to confirm it. So we have to send that out to a, a reference laboratory for confirmation. Um, but basically gabapentin is a prescription medication uh, usually prescribed under the trade name Neurontin that is uh, used for treating seizures, can also be used for treating uh, neuropathy or uh, neuropathic pain. And it is a uh, considered a central nervous system depressant. So it can uh, definitely impair driving uh, by causing symptoms like drowsiness and sedation, dizziness, uh, loss of coordination, uh, other types of symptoms that are generally associated with uh, depressant type drugs. Wow. Okay, that's that's interesting. So Greg, moving to the prosecution of these cases, can you start by explaining the different DUI charges and the difference between them when it comes to alcohol and marijuana, prescription drugs, and a mix of them all? Sure. So there are two primary statutes that are related to DUIs and drug DUIs. They're both in the California Vehicle Code. The first one is California Vehicle Code section 23152 which relates to different kinds of DUIs. And the second is California Vehicle Code section 23153, which relates to the same sorts of DUIs, but involves cases where there is an injury to somebody other than the driver. Those two sections are, like I said, very similar to one another, and they are punished in the same way and have to be proven essentially in the same way. Within each of those codes, there are four primary sections that we prosecute there are two subsections that specifically relate to alcohol. Those are subsection A and subsection B of vehicle code 23152 and vehicle code 23153. Subsection A makes it illegal to drive under the influence of alcohol. If the driver is no longer able to drive a vehicle with the caution of a sober person using ordinary care under similar circumstances. Subsection B makes it illegal to drive with the blood alcohol level of 0.08% by weight. We also prosecute under subsection F, which makes it illegal to drive under the influence of a drug that can include illicit drugs or prescribed drugs. If the driver is no longer able to drive a vehicle with the caution of a sober person using ordinary care under similar circumstances. And finally, we also prosecute under subsection G, which makes it illegal to drive under the influence of a combination of alcohol and drugs. The penal code prescribes similar potential sentences, whether the DUI is for alcohol, for drugs, or for a combination of both. The most important factor in determining a sentence uh, for a defendant on a case is whether it is a felony or a misdemeanor. The case is a felony. It is typically punishable by a maximum punishment of three years if there aren't any enhancements for the DUI. For misdemeanors, the sentences are less than you will see for felonies. A first DUI has a maximum punishment of six months. A third misdemeanor DUI has a maximum sentence of a year. What a defendant is ultimately sentenced to and what the possible punishments are depends primarily both on a drug DUI and a DUI, 
on the defendant's prior DUI history if there was a collision and the level of the defendant's intoxication. There are some differences ultimately in sentencing between drug DUIs versus alcohol DUIs. Alcohol DUIs typically come with conditions that the defendant complete an alcohol program or specific alcohol classes. When there are drug DUIs that don't involve alcohol, different conditions apply because now we want drug conditions. So for example, for a drug DUI, a common condition at sentencing is that the defendant will either have to serve an extra 30 days or they have to complete what's known as the WellSpace program. WellSpace is a program uh, that helps defendants here in Sacramento County with their drug problems. Drug DUIs also come with conditions that the defendant not knowingly use or possess drugs. And drug conditions typically come also with search and seizure clauses to ensure that somebody who has a drug DUI does not continue abusing those drugs or driving while well under the influence of those drugs. I have a quick question. Sure. So this is both for you and Craig. Craig, in your analysis of the drugs, if it's a prescription drug that doesn't impair, you still you still know that that is present, correct? But then Greg, does, is that included in a criminal case if it's a, a drug that's not known to impair or that doesn't have a warning about not driving while under the while taking that medication? Yeah, so at the lab, the testing that we do, we are looking for drugs in general, not just uh, impairing drugs. Uh, so we will find drugs like ibuprofen, uh, acetaminophen, we see caffeine, obviously, all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and we report what we find. Again, we're, we're not just looking for those things that might be impairing. And so then, Greg, do you not include any of the over-the-counter or prescription, any of, the, any of those things that are found in a, in a DUI case? So things that are prescribed can be found in a DUI case, and they are used sometimes in a DUI case. Um, normally, what will happen is we will get reports from the lab showing both the level of alcohol as well as the level of any amount of drugs in the system. If there's a question about what is causing the impairment or the impaired driving, we will contact somebody at the lab, typically whoever did the actual lab. They have expertise in impairment and we will inquire as to that lab technician, uh, whether, for example, a prescription drug actually was part of the impairment in a case. We do have cases that are based, I believe, strictly on prescription drugs. Often, it's not based solely on the prescribed drug in the amount, but also other evidence in the field. For example, an officer's observations of the person's driving or poor driving on that day. Often that is based on the poor driving that somebody has combined with the drugs that are in their system. I don't see cases that we prosecute that are based on caffeine. I don't believe that we have any cases where that would be a big caseload. Impaired for caffeine. Um, I have seen that in some of the labs, and that's just not something we pursue. Typically, what I've seen is cases where they have drugs in their system and those drugs are impairing. And if we have any issues or questions about whether they're impairing, we always inquire to the lab tech. And if they say it's not impairing, then we wouldn't charge uh, that specific drug. Uh, DUI or uh, alcohol drug combination DUI. Okay, that makes sense. This is for everybody. What do you advise people do to avoid misusing prescriptions and ultimately ultimately ending up driving? Well, um, I uh, first, obviously, the most important thing is to talk with your doctor and um, to you know have them explain to you that you know the but all the all those side effects all the risks that are involved in taking whatever uh, drug you're taking be it impairing or unimpairing um, and then um, once they understand make sure that you read um, the prescription bottle itself it's going to have warnings going to tell you to take um, you know not to take things um, to take things when to take it take it on a uh, empty stomach take it on a full stomach uh, I had a I had a heart uh, uh, blood pressure medication that was prescribed to me recently, and um, it one of the things that says do not drink grapefruit juice of all things in the world. It said do not drink grapefruit juice. You're gonna have a bad reaction to it. So uh, again, that's a very important conversation between you and your doctor. Another uh, person that you should rely on is a pharmacist. Again, 
having them explain to you all of the, the those dangers, all the warnings, all the things when you're supposed to do, ind- indications, contraindications, and then recognizing that if you have a potential impairing drug, the first time you take it, understand that it can um, in, uh, in interfere with your ability to operate a motor vehicle safely. And if you feel different than you normally feel, there's the chance that it does. And until you understand its effects, um, if you get behind the wheel and uh, we're out on patrol and we see you driving um, and we we see driving pattern, we're going to contact you and we're going to uh, assess you and see if there if you're driving under the influence. And if you're driving under the influence, um, even if it's a prescription drug, you're going to go um, you're going to go to jail. Yeah, I think everything that Officer Herbert said is spot on. Um, I think one of the issues is that there's uh, a lack of understanding um, generally in the public that prescription drugs uh, can, that you can still get a DUI on a prescription drug. That, you know, just because it's by prescription um, doesn't mean that it's okay to drive with it. Just because your doctor is telling you to take it doesn't mean that you're going to be safe to drive. I think that's one of the first things that people need to understand is that even though they might be taking their drugs exactly as uh, their doctor is telling them to, that there are still risks involved. And that's why, again, everything that Officer Herbert said about talking to your doctor, having those conversations, um, not skipping the pharmacy consult when you pick up your medications, you know, take advantage of that opportunity to talk with the pharmacist. Um, and really understand what potential risks go along with that medication. Um, you know, a lot of times as people get older, they are taking multiple medications. So it, it could be, you know, they have several different conditions that they're dealing with. And maybe they've been fine with the medications that they're on, but now a new medication gets added to their regimen. And that can change uh, the overall effects that they're going to experience. So again, having those conversations is definitely important. Um, the other thing Officer Herbert said was, you know, if you feel different, uh, you know, don't don't drive. Um, I would say another thing is if you can make your family members aware uh, or make your friends aware of what you're dealing with. You know, people may not always be able to do that uh, for various reasons. But if you can, that gives you additional people who can kind of keep an eye out uh, for possible signs of impairment. Um, and, you know, they can be another uh, a person who might prevent you from getting behind the wheel of a car when maybe you think you're okay, but they see some other signs or symptoms uh, and they know you're taking a certain medication, they can kind of, again, help you out and stop you from uh, getting behind the wheel and getting on the roadway. So in my opinion, what somebody should do to make sure that they avoid misusing prescription drugs and ultimately end up driving when they shouldn't, is they need to talk to their doctor. Just like Officer Herbert said, just like Craig Trebold said, talk to your doctor, ask questions. It's important to get the information to understand if you'll be okay. And it's not just about talking to your doctor the first time. Lots of people have doses that change. Doses go up, doses go down. Particularly when your dose of a prescription drug goes up, you should ask your doctor what kind of effects that will have on you and pay very close attention to how you feel. If you feel unsafe to drive, don't drive. There are so many options today to get around. You can get an Uber, you can get a Lyft, you can get a friend who can take you somewhere. So until you know how the drug is actually affecting you, don't drive until you know you'd be safe to do so. Perfect. Okay. Is there anything else that anyone wants the listeners to know before we close our discussion today that we didn't cover? Uh, I would like to add that, um, you know, we've talked about um, the, the conversations with our doctors um, we talked about the conversations with the um, the pharmacist. We talked about taking a variety of medications and they can have potential interactions. But I think that we would be remiss if we didn't talk about um, an, an intentional abuse. So there's lots of stuff out there um, that's very popular right now that we see um, and see it all over the place. Um, for instance, would be snorting Xanax. Um, I can be prescribed Xanax all day, but my doctor is not going to tell me to snort it. Um, and so when we change the route to which we get it to the brain, that oftentimes has a very um, adverse effect in how we feel and it can be impairing. Uh, 
Um, and so when you take a drug that is, uh, you know, like Xanax and you snort it, you're totally changing the route. Another thing to do is um, if I wanted to eat a tablet when I'm not supposed to eat a tablet, a lot of uh, medication nowadays have uh, extended release mechanisms within inside that tablet itself. And when you crush it, you're destroying that and you're getting all of the intended drug dosage in one shot. Um, where it's supposed to go over a 12 hour or a different um, time period, um, it's supposed to go over a lengthy time period, you're getting all of it at once. And so when people do that, um, they're having um, major effects and they, they're definitely impairing. So we have to pay attention and, and, and you need to understand that if you take it differently than how you're supposed to take the drug, it can be very, um, it can be very impairing. And officers are trained to look for that. We're going to look for the straws. We're going to look for, you know, how many, how many prescription, you know, pills that you have in the bottle um, if it's in the vehicle. And um, we're going to see, you, are you taking more than you're supposed to? Um, are you doing it the way you're supposed to? We're going to ask these questions. Um, we're going to look for, we're going to look in your nose and see if we can see residue. So we're going to pay attention to all of that stuff. So uh, again, we're out there, we're looking, um, pay attention to your doctor, pay attention to your pharmacist, ask lots of questions. If you feel different, there is a that you you are impaired. If you feel different than you normally feel, there is a good chance that you're impaired and you should not get behind the wheel at all. Yeah, thank you, Officer Herbert, for bringing up the folks who are intentionally misusing or driving under prescription medicines. That that's a big component. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, very much. So we will um, have some additional resource information on our podcast page as well um, for our listeners. And so, thank you, everybody, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. You can find all of the Justice Journal podcasts on our website at sacda.org, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube.